feel that the cause of Christ and a lot of the Christian are at a low ebb, on the back foot. Dare I even say, batting on a losing wicket. You see, the first half of the book of Esther has got God's people harried and harassed by the enemies of God, who are therefore the enemies of God's people. As Jesus said, John 15, 18 to 20, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember, says Jesus, what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they'll obey yours also. The, the trouble is that we see the sort of thing Jesus spoke of in these verses happening to us and around us. And we start to think we're on the wrong side of history, but he's warned us of this already and told us to expect it. And if you only look at the first part of the book of Esther, it leaves you thinking that God's people, well, it may leave you thinking God's people really are on the wrong side of history without help and without hope. Their enemies, here in the book, particularly Haman, are laughing. But God's people are certainly not. Then chapter 6 happens and the God who's always there but never gets mentioned in this book of Esther turns it all decisively around in the stuff in chapter 6. And the resolution of all the troubles of God's people begins there. The structure of the book is really closely linked into its message and it goes like this. Think of it like this. You know there's a nine-branched candle in Jewish symbolism. It's called... It's called the, the Hanukkah. Well, in the book of Esther, there are four corresponding parts, ones that balance each other up to each of the downswing and upswing sections of the fortunes of the people of God described in this book. And then there's a single section at the centre of it all where the narrative pivots away from the misfortune towards the restoration of the people of God, that turning point. It just seems odd to me. The pattern of the story corresponds so closely to that nine branch candlestick known as a Hanukkah, which lies at the heart of the Jewish festival. But in any event, try to see the structure of the book of Esther this way. There's a central candlestick, which is the turning point of the fortunes of God's people. And you read about that in chapter six, verses one to eleven. Then there are four branches on each side of that central candlestick going more or less straight up, but the ones at the sides, they, they curve out and upwards from the base of that central one. And on each of those, you have firstly a prologue, say at the outside end on the left, at the beginning, balanced at the end, say on the outside end of that candlestick at the right, by an epilogue. And then as the candlestick branches move in, you, you get a bad situation for God's people, let's say on the first candle in on the left, balanced by a reversal of fortunes for God's people, in the corresponding branch, say the first one in on the right, and the one thing balances out the other. There's a misfortune, say, on the one side, and it's balanced by the one on the right, with things going uh, being reversed and turned round, so that God's purpose in his people is preserved. Now, oddly enough, at the Feast of Hanukkah, these candles are inserted into the candle holder incrementally each night from right to left, but lit from left to right, highlighting the correspondence of the sides together. The book's all about the disastrous misfortunes of God's people being reversed, sometimes quite ironically, without fuss or fanfare, by the God who was never named, but who was always active, fulfilling his purposes and protecting his people. And I hope the sort of candlestick uh, correspondence of one side balancing the other helps you understand what's going on. Well, let's look first of all, we're going to look in three sections of the book, the downward slope uh, with these things going wrong and then it's being reversed so that God's people are, are, are looked after um, afterwards by his intervention. Firstly the downward slope then is in chapter 1 verses 5 to 14. The slide down towards the big turning point it happens in the first five chapters of the book and it, it's as if we were looking at sort of one side of that candlestick there leading up to the central one where the turning point is. There's a prologue and then these three things go badly for the people of God embedded in the big storyline. Firstly, there's the prologue. Chapter 1, verses 2 to 23. Chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 23. So in the prologue, we're introduced to the greatness of King Xerxes, right? We're introduced to that in this big feast as Queen Vashti, who dared to resist him, gets deposed. That's chapter 1, verses 1 to 22. And Esther, who is Jewish, gets chosen as a replacement in this role that we've just seen is a totally powerless, totally exploited role 
for that for that woman. She even has to keep her Jewishness a secret, such as her powerlessness there at the court of the Persian king. See it in chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. But in chapter 2, verses 19 to 23, something seems to go right, but then doesn't. Mordecai overhears two officers of the guard conspiring to kill the king. And Mordecai, her uncle, tells Esther, and Esther, the new king, uh, the new queen, warns the king, giving the credit for the information to her uncle Mordecai, and the guards are executed. But here's the thing. Nothing is done for Mordecai to reward him, or do anything to secure the future of God's people there, in that foreign land, Susa, heart of the Persian kingdom. Nothing is done for Mordecai or for the future of God's people, on whom God's plans are based. This prologue here is the first branch of that nine-branch candlestick. It's going to be balanced by a huge reversal at the end in the epilogue in chapters 9 and 10, where the feast given for Esther as she's inducted into this helpless and spiritually compromised position as queen it gets reversed. She's now a valued individual, open and outwardly Jewish and so on, and the Feast of Purim is, is celebrated there in a totally different situation on the other side of the candlestick. But we'll be coming to that great reversal later. So, the helpless situation of Esther as queen, then, is exposed in the next sort of section, in chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, where Haman comes up with a plot to destroy the Jews on the day that was called in their calendar, the 13th of the month, Adar. Esther, in chapter 3, verse 2, says, All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honour to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour. So, Esther 3, verses 5 to 6. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour, he was enraged. Well, Haman's a powerful man, so this isn't going to go well. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of only killing Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. This really isn't looking good now. It gets even worse, though, because what happens next is that Haman goes in to see the king and bribes the king to issue a decree to get the Jews annihilated. Well, that's pretty tough for the Jews. But bear in mind that at the time, God's plans and purposes for humanity were tied up in what he was doing with the Jewish people. Just as his plans and purposes now focus on what he's doing in the multilingual, multinational New Covenant Church. See, see there's such a lot more than the history of a particular exiled refugee nation that's going on here it's the plan and the purpose of god which he's working out through those people and it's all very threatened by the look of it by what goes on in these verses well they really are in a bad position so by the time we come to the next section the response in chapter 4 verses 1 to 17 here's where mordecai makes his strategic appeal to esther the rather impotent seeming queen who's both a jew in hiding and the very publicly recognised plaything of this absolute ruler, King Xerxes. What can this woman actually do? Well, for myself, I see this conversation as very decisive, although the turning point in the story is yet to come. But here in chapter 4, in chapter 4, verse 8, Esther's uncle Mordecai sends her the edict for the anni annihilation of the Jews and tells her, go into the throne room and plead with the king to turn this round. And Esther says, hang on a minute. Everyone knows that everyone who goes uninvited into the king's presence gets killed. And more than that, it's been 30 days since she was called to go to the king. She's obviously thinking her call and his affections might have waned a little bit with this king. So she's even less chance of sorting it out with him and coming out alive. Well, Mordecai's response to that is to ask why she thinks that she alone of the Jews is going to survive the massacre planned for the 13th of Adar. And he goes on. Esther 4 verse 14. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family would perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now that little phrase there is the one that everyone quotes from this Bible book, you know, for such a time as this. But I reckon what comes next is the decisive part of this chapter, and it comes not from the mouth of Mordecai, but from the mouth of Esther. Chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. She says, Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I'll go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Ooh, did you get that? If I perish, I perish. Courage and faith. 
So Mordecai went away and carried out all Esther's instructions. Now, now notice especially Esther's newfound courage in entrusting herself into the hands of God, again without any direct mention of the Lord, who is the one who throughout Scripture is the one who inspires such courageous faith. He's the one who inspires that sort of thing. The Bible doesn't it uses phrases like the spirit of the Lord came upon such and such a person and they, you know, fill in the blanks there. Notice also that such courageous faith is the key to leadership. Because suddenly the impotent plaything of the violent and abusive ruler gives orders to her uncle, unheard of in Jewish culture of the time, and he does as she commands him. And the big turning point then gets set up in the next section, in chapter 5, 1 to 14. Here's the development. Chapter 5, 1 to 14. Haman sets up a very high pole to impale Mordecai on. Stick him on it. Kill him by sticking him on it. And Haman does that because of Mordecai's refusal to bow down to him. That's what Haman sets up. But Esther sets things up for her to throw a banquet for the king, and of course all his courtiers, including Mordecai, at which she plans for Haman to get his comeuppance. As a reader or as a listener, you just know that with these two things going on, things are going to come to a head. Mordecai is set up his pole to stick Haman on, and Esther sets up a banquet to which Mordecai is going to be invited. Uh, to which Haman, Haman, sorry, is going to be invited. But whose head is going to be had? Somebody's head is going to be had here. Either Mordecai's going on the spike, or Haman is going to come down. Well, well the turning point in chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, goes like this. That night the king couldn't sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. And it was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honour and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole that he'd set up for him. And the attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court, bring him in, the king ordered. And when Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honour? Well, he, Haman thought to himself, who is it that the king would rather honour than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honour... Have them bring a, a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honour, and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse, and do just as you have suggested, for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you've recommended. What a turnaround. What a reversal. Go at once, the king commanded Haman, and do it. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what the what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Now that is that is humiliating, isn't it, for Haman? And we could just see it as a personal setback for Haman. But the author really wants us to know for sure that the lot of God's people has decisively turned. It says, afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And his advisers and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. How encouraging is that? Not. And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Queen Esther had prepared. Now, now look, the turning point has been reached. As these characters, ironically Haman's support team, proclaim the turnaround to us.
The upswing in the fortunes of God's people is about to begin. We've been looking at the downswing. But God is, is now at that central point, at that turning point, turning things completely unexpectedly around, although no one has yet mentioned his name and there's been no writing at all on the sky. Well, thirdly, then we come to the upswing at chapter 7, verse 1, and that runs right through to chapter 10, verse 3. The central theological point here is that the God of the Bible operates behind the scenes in a fallen world to turn the fallenness around. And as his people are crucial to his restorative plans and purposes, that means that God turns things around for his covenant people. And he does it even when his people's imperfections are obvious. Firstly then, as this upswing he's engineered behind the scenes comes into play, Esther throws a second banquet. You can go through the book of Esther and look at all the banquets that Esther throws. Who says God isn't for party girls, eh? He certainly is. And look what he's doing in her life. There's this consequence then. Esther welcomes the king, chapter 7, verse 1 to seven ten, and the bad guy Haman both to her banquet. Now the scene has been set in chapter 5 for her pitch to be made for God's people. And as the guests gather... The king bowls the full toss, as it were, to her leg stump. Esther chapter 7, verses 1 to 2. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, hmm, it's quite a banquet, isn't it? The king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be granted. Hmm, Esther now, it's two days into the banquet, two days into the drinking for the king, she's ready to make your request. She says, in the presence of the king, in the presence of wicked Haman, I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. If you had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he, the man who's dared to do such a thing? Esther said, an adversary and enemy, this vile Haman, and then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Well, the king is absolutely fuming to hear that, and he goes out into the garden to fume in private and consider his response, which is not characteristic of his behaviour until now. He's normally a guy who fires from the hip in a drunk field fury. But that really sets things up for Haman's demise. Haman, realising the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. And just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining to plead, you see, with, with Esther. And the king exclaimed when he just came in and saw that, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? And as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Things are really turning round, aren't they? And a eunuch standing by suggested impaling Haman on the pole he'd set up for Mordecai. And the rest is history. What a reversal. Well, at one level, that's Haman dealt with. But there's still a legal problem with the royal edict that Haman had got the king to issue to annihilate the Jews. And this is where it all starts to unfold in chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. What are we going to do? The king has issued this decree. And according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which is what they were... You couldn't turn back on that. That was it. There was no cancelling that edict. Well, it's not too complicated. It says Mordecai to the king when Mordecai highlights the problem. The Lord of the Medes and the Persians couldn't be cancelled, but it'd be fine if a second decree could be issued to say the Jews should oppose and slay anyone who tried to enact the first decree. Oh, great idea, Mordecai. You had second decree. We're going to make that now. No problem at all. It's issued and the Jews in Susa rejoiced. So, Chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. On the 13th day of Adar, the Jews destroyed their enemies. Chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. Along with Haman's dangerous family. Chapter 9, verses 6 to 19. There can't be any um, revenge taken because the people who do it are gone. See? But that wasn't quite the end of the matter. Because then we get the epilogue, chapter 9, verse 20 to chapter 10, verse 3. And this epilogue institutes the festival of Purim to remember and to annually celebrate the victory of God, turning things round on behalf of his people to preserve his people and his purpose. Still without even mentioning his name. Esther authorises Purim. Her Jewishness is now in the public arena. It's on display. 
And now things are better than they were at the beginning of this tortuous experience for God's people. Because now these representatives of God's people, Esther, Mordecai, they sit at the heart of the institutions of the state where they are now powerful to serve God's interest in the interest of his imperfect but covenant people. Great story, isn't it? What's the point? Let's come to a conclusion. See, we've been highlighting the structure of this book, which is illustrating the message of the book, the theological purpose of the book. The structure emphasises a theological purpose. It's showing us something really important about the character of God, particularly important for people living in times when faith seems to be under the hammer. Now, look, God could have told us the relevant truth about himself for his people enduring such times of crisis, using just a few sentences to express the proposition that this book makes. But he didn't. He tells a story to reveal the truth about himself, which is people need to know when God's cause seems to be going backwards. Why make a story? It makes sense. Think about it. If you're going to work with somebody, you need to get to know them, don't you? You know that from the lives you've lived already, don't you? It's very hard to work effectively with someone until you get to know them a bit. And when you get to know somebody, you don't exchange your personality profile, you know, the output from a psychological profile and exercise with one another. You sit down almost socially and in one way or another, you are saying to that person, what's your story? What's your story? In some very direct cultural context, you might find people putting precisely that question to one another when they first meet. They sit down, they get the coffee out, they, you know, they start chat, chat, chat. And then one guy says to the other, what's your story? In our culture, we fish for it more indirectly, but that's fundamentally the question we're dancing around when we're trying to get to know somebody. What's your story? And the reason we have biblical narrative, like the book of Esther, is that we're discovering the answer to the question, what's your story? And we, when this is being done with reference to God, we're, we're asking the question to find out what God is like. We discover what he's like in the way that he relates to people in a similar range of experiences to the experiences that we ourselves might be having. So what's the story with God in a situation where God's people are on the back foot and coming under the cosh? You look at the story of Esther to find out. And when you do, what do you find out? Firstly, God isn't one for writing stuff on the sky every day of the week. But secondly, he's one who acts, often behind the scenes, to prosper his cause through his people. And he does that almost imperceptibly a lot of the time. But nonetheless, this book has got this set of ironic reversals of the fortunes of God's imperfect people. And that runs right through the structure of the book. Thinking again of that nine branch candlestick called the Hanukkah from Jewish culture. Once again, first branch curves up on the left with a prologue at the top of it, where there's the awful Persian festival in, in chapter one. Verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 23, the awful festival where the king demands his queen comes out to flaunt herself for his guests to go at. And she refuses and is replaced after another gawp fest to select Queen Vasti's replacement by Esther, who should have been a good Jewish girl and not up for that sort of thing at all. And end of that, there's the non-ideal situation in which Esther ends up being the king's next woman on display. None of this is good. But by the epilogue, God has reversed this first fruit of the fall with God's people elevated from the flesh pots of Susa to the two highest positions in the kingdom. And with a festival established to celebrate the God who does such things to protect both his people and his purposes. And then in chapter 2, verses 19 to 23, there's a plot against the king, which Mordecai foils, but doesn't get any reward or benefit from, either for him or for God's people. But on the corresponding branch on the other side of the candelabrum, we read, chapter 9, verse 20 to 28, of the feast that's instituted to celebrate the failure of Haman's plot and the rescue of God's people. Now, you've got those contrasts right through the book as one reversal after another for God's people gets turned back later. And that's the structure of the book throughout. And, and we'll see more about that as we work through it. The message quite simply is this from the structure of this book. The experience God, of God's people is coloured by the fallenness of this world and its opposition to God's people and his purposes. And that's all the stuff on the left hand side, if you like, of that candelabrum. But God is at work constantly, often invisibly behind the scenes, when his imperfect people muster the courage born of trusting him to act sacrificially, to put themselves on the line, and decisively to follow what they know to be the passions of God's heart. When that happens, he acts to divide, decisively turn back the reversals that a fallen world seems to afflict on the fulfilment of the passions of his heart. 
and that's where you get the other side of the candlestick the reversals now that is a powerful message for those of us who are seeking to live faithfully for the lord in a culture like ours where it is all too easy to start thinking that christians are somehow living here on the wrong side of history our god the god of the book of esther is a god who turns around the fallen side of our experience to revolutionize to turn right round all of that as it were on the other side of things to establish his people and his purpose for his greater glory god bless you have a great week